Clemens is one of the rare pitchers who can get by with only two pitches if he wants. He has a great fastball and probably the best splitter in the major league. So those two pitches are very dominant pitches. He can all he also throws a slider and an occasional changeup. But those are his two out pitches. And look at that, 85 in the third innings, only 60 hits allowed. Not many want to stand in against uh, the Rocket. And let's take a look at the defense. We talked about Jose Canseco in left. 19 homers, 18 steals, nearly halfway in both categories. Tavares, who hit a homer here yesterday, first ball swinging. Shannon Stewart in center field, one away. Now Joe Carter on his night comes to the plate. Another warm welcome for Joe Carter. Played his first game back in Toronto here on Friday and had an excellent uh, ball game. And then hit a home run here yesterday, which brought back memories of that great home run that won the World Series in 1993. He's going after the first pitch. Coming over is Darren Fletcher, but this one is in among the spectators out of play. Joe Carter. On July 27, 1996, hit one up there. That's the fifth deck. And it's tied as the second longest home run in the history of this ballpark, 483 feet. John, when he hit the home run yesterday, they were cheering him while he was running around the bases. Of course, his team was way behind, so that may have had something to do with it. In this series, there you see it, three for eight, including yesterday's homer, and four RBIs, which is what you think of when you think of Joe Carter. However, the RBI totals are not real high as an Oriole. That's a foul off to the right. One ball and two strikes. And uh, Carter with 23 RBIs for the Orioles in 185 at bats. Roger Clemens struggled four starts. He had four straight starts where he was really wild, so to speak. He was walking too many hitters and got himself into trouble. Now he's back to being more aggressive, attacking people with the fastball early in the count. You mentioned uh, Carter and RBIs. He is hitting 294 with men in scoring position this year, but has not hit a home run with anybody in scoring position. Two and two. And he struck him out. Now there's that great splitter we talked about. He throws so hard you do not have enough time to wait and decide whether the pitch is going to be in the strike zone or not. And you'll watch he'll watch Carter. This pitch starts in the strike zone. Right there is a strike and all of a sudden it's the bottom falls out and you just do not have enough time because he throws so hard you just do not have the time to read the pitch and you chase a lot of splitters in the dirt. Now the 39 year old Harold Baines. And that's too low for ball one. And John it's one of the reasons you saw the first two hitters go after the first pitch. They do not want to get behind in the counter Roger and have to try to fight off that splitter. And Baines takes a little bit low again. Two balls and no strikes. Harold Baines. 39 years of age but he's hitting 297 four homers 28 driven in. A native of the eastern shore of Maryland. And it goes to three and oh the Orioles big home run hitter. And their big RBI man this year, Rafael Palmero, is on deck. Clemens has been walking more this year than in the past. And there is a walk to Baines, a four pitch walk. Well, once he got behind Baines, he tried to make good pitches instead of grooving one, and he walks his first hitter in this ball game. Tim Johnson, the Manager of the Blue Jays in his first year here, replacing uh, Cito Gaston and uh, of course Ray Miller in the Oriole dugout as a first year manager for Baltimore, replacing Davey Johnson, Rafael Palmero. 17 homers, 53 driven in. Right back at Clemens, a squibber. And that ends the inning. So, Three of the four Orioles chase that first pitch. No score. Can Seiko do up third when we get back? Well, you see that pitch of the way. Green actually goes out and pulls it to right field for a base hit. 
Joe Carter. Here is Jose Canseco. 235 average, but 19 homers and 40 runs batted in. Taking all the way in that one. One ball and no strike. Ball in the dirt. And now Hoyle's out to talk to Pete Smith. John, we were here, I don't know, three weeks ago, and Canseco got the game winning hit. He started swinging the bat well, and then he got off to a good start. He went up to like 250 something. Then he had an 0 for 24 slump in there, and he didn't get back. He has just broke that 0 for 24, and he's been struggling a little bit ever since. Hit a couple of home runs. In Tampa to get back on track. Yeah, he was three for three with two walks tonight. We were here back on May the 17th when Seattle was in town. Back to the bag at first, Sean Green. The Blue Jays are one of the most uh, prolific stolen base teams in the American League right now. They've stolen 78 bases in their first 68 games. Back to the bag again. It's Green. By the way, they have decisions in 67 games. But uh, one game ended up being tied and then rained out. He played over again. Let's see what Tim Johnson has in mind. Green at first. Big cut. Some things don't change. It looks like you're trying to hit it 500 feet every time. Well, he does not get cheated at the plate. As one of my first minor league coaches used to say, he gets three wall cuts. He is swinging for the wall. Watching Pete Smith, the Blue Jays should be able to take advantage of him as far as stealing bases. The base stealers, because he has a pretty high leg kick and he gives you time to get a good jump. There goes Green. Boyle's throw. Green has the steal his 15th of the year and no chance for Hoyles to throw him out because of the slow leg kick by Smith. Uh, they can do that all night with the guys who can run a little bit. And watch you'll see him he gets, he'll get a great jump See, he's four feet on the carpet by. One ball two strikes now to Ken Seiko. One out runner at second no score. Two balls, two strikes. Pete Smith uh, in the past has been with the Atlanta Braves, with the Braves for many, many years. It was a, a year with the Mets, a year with the Reds, and last year with San Diego. Well, he's changed the delivery a little bit. He's throwing a variety of curveballs, some three quarters. He hasn't thrown that straight over the top one much yet, but he does have one. Trying to sneak that fastball by him, but it was too low. On deck is Carlos Delgado. Delgado, another outstanding hitter, but also a guy who hits over 300, unlike Canseco. Got power, and he hits a pretty good average. Green at second, one out. Three and two to Canseco. And he walked it. That puts two men on now for Carlos Delgado. John, from the first time I, I saw Delgado, I always felt he was going to be a star because he but flying right past his nose, yeah. That's a foul ball at the first base side. One ball, one strike. Learn to uh, hang loose when he faces the rocket. Well, I think that's what most hard throwers would like for you to do. Hang loose. Just missing on the outside. Two and one the count. Not according to Roger. Just over the outside, <laughs> according to Roger. <laughs> Can't take it for the weekend. BJ Surhoff and Cal Ripken will follow. Alomar, by the way, Joe, I mean, this is a he's one of the premier players in the game. 300 hitter year in, year out. Against the Rocket, 211 lifetime batting average. Well, I'm sure that's why Roger wants to make sure he hangs loose. 
There's not too many guys hit much better than 211 against Rod. Yeah, right. Yeah. He's uh, he doesn't give up a lot of hit. But see, this is one of the problems he's had. He's in danger of walking the leadoff hitter. Three and one. And he has walked the leadoff hitter. His second walk of the game. We saw a very fine job of pitching by Pete Smith to get out of a jam in the first inning. Now watch to Gel Delgado change up. Strike two and strike three, even though the ball gets away. Good breaking ball. And another one to Stanley, same spot. And that's one of those if they're going to have to show me that they can hit it before I stop throwing it to them. He threw them two in a row and he got them out. Good pitching there by Smith. Here's BJ Surhoff, left handed hitter, veteran. And that's ball one. Clemens starts behind him. Sherhoff has 47 runs battered in, second on the club. Scoring runs has not really been the big problem for the Orioles. They average five runs a game. But giving up runs has been a problem, which you would have figured that would have been one of their main strengths going in. Strong rotation, strong bullpen, but they have been afflicted with injuries to the rotation. And then Ray Miller's bullpen has been uh, overextended. And right now they have Messina back. He missed six or seven starts while he was out. Jimmy Key is on the disabled list. Scott Kamenecki is on the disabled list. So three of his five starters are or have been on the DL. Back to first again is Alamon the threat to steal. Stolen eight bases out of 12, you know, eight, 12 attempts. He's always been able to a few bases. Back. Back there again. Although he's not getting a very large lead at first base. Clement seems convinced he's going, Joe. Jim Johnson seems to be one of the other. Well, you have to remember Carter, Joe Carter says he has a book on all the players, the opposing team, so he knows their tendencies. One ball, one strike now to Sirhoff. The Orioles, according to Ray Miller, the big problem with the injuries to the rotation, they've had too many starts where the pitcher's been knocked out early and they've had to go to that bullpen. There goes Alomar. Sherhaw swinging away. This is going to be a tough play. They don't make it. And over to third is Alomar. I know it's a tough call to make afterwards, but. It appeared to me that they should have let that ball bounce and it might have gone foul because they didn't really have a play on Serhoff as first base. It'll be a base hit for Serhoff. And watch this ball. Alomar took off and they never slows down. He sees that they're going to make a play at first base. So he keeps right on running around to third, which is good heads up base running. But again, I thought they should have let that ball bounce right here. Let that ball bounce. And take a chance because you're not going to be able to get the runner at first anyway. Craig Graybeck, the second baseman, taking the throw. So the Orioles are set up nicely now as Cal Ripken comes up. 2,546 consecutive game. And an RBI single to that. Alomar scores. And we've really seen the, the value of Roberto Alomar in this inning. I mean, he. Almost single handedly has given the Orioles a run here, taking a walk, getting himself to third base on a 50 foot chopper from where he scored. And you can see Roger, he had struggled falling behind the first two hitters in this inning. He comes with a fastball to Ripken, and Ripken is a good inside hitter. He's sitting on a fastball and he pulls it in the hole. Nice try there by Gonzalez, but he could not come up with it. Ripken's 31st RBI of the year. He's been struggling lately. John, we've seen him struggle a lot in the last few years. When it looks like he's going to struggle all season, he gets back and gets hot. Boyles drops down a bunt. Now to move the runners over. I think they were a little surprised by that. That's not what you expect from Hoyles. Sir off to third, Ripken to second. Well, that's something that you don't see very often, especially in the American League, where you have people bunting with runners at first and second early in the ball game. But when you're going against Roger Clemens, you figure maybe I better try to scaffold some runs any way I can. 
And now they can get one more run if Rebel just puts the ball in play. This is the uh, second sacrifice month of the season for Chris Hoyle, so he's done it before. Ray Miller. The middle infielders are deep, so ground ball, either one of them should get a run. That ball one, serve off in third, Ripken in second. It's been quite a rally, a walk, a 50-foot single, a roller just through the hole to left, and a bunt. <laughs> They've got a run on the board and two more in scoring position. That's National League baseball. Yeah. <laughs> Ray Miller, of course, spent many years in the National League as a pitching coach for Jim Leland in Pittsburgh. And that's a ball. Two and over the count. And he says, really, they've been getting a lot more production from Palmero, but also from Serhoff since he put Alamore in the fifth spot in the order. Alamore, over the years, had always hit either first or second. <laughs> Revelay takes a spot. I'm not so sure that you can use Alamar to protect Palmero. I mean, I'm sure that things are just working because they're two good players. But this Alomar protected Palmero. I don't really believe that happened because Palmero is a power hitter that hits a lot of home runs and drives in you know, a lot of runs. There's the suicide squeeze. Rebele is tagged out by Delgado, but scoring is Serhoff. Ripken to third. I mean, this really is yep. National League baseball. The suicide squeeze employed, and the Orioles have two runs home against Clemens. I guess. Ray Miller says, hey, we got a shot against Clemens that we better make sure we get as many as possible. Well, let's take a look at this. Good job there at third base by Serhoff. He doesn't give it away too quickly. And also a good job, of course, by Revelay to get the ball down. He squares around, gets it down. And a good job there all around. That's a perfect suicide squeeze. So the sacrifice bunt by Hoyles, followed by the suicide squeeze bunt by Revelay. It is 2 nothing Orioles. Ripken at third, and uh, Jesus Tavares, the leadoff man, will come up now. So Rebele does not get charged with a time at bat and does get credit for a run batted in. 2 to nothing Baltimore. Only one ball has left the infield in this inning. Fastball missing. Well, the one thing you have to worry about if you're Rodgers falling behind early by too many runs because the Blue Jays are not a hitting machine where they scored just lots of runs for you. Left field. Canseco got a late break on it. Now he's back. He <laughs> had it all the way. <laughs> I meant to do that. <laughs> That's the one well hit ball of the inning. Two nothing Baltimore. After one and a half. Thing a jump. Well, here at Ray Miller, this time he didn't bunt. He put the running game in. Well, a lot of this has to do with he's throwing a lot of balls in the dirt, and they know that he's concentrating on throwing his pitch, so they timing and just take off. They know that he's concentrating on the hitter, not the base runners, and you see the bobble there by Fletcher. No chance to get Alomar. He had a great jump anyway. The infield is playing back. John Ball could bring home a run here or a fly ball. Well, you have to give the Orioles credit up to this point. I mean, they're doing a lot of little things here against Clemens. I've always felt the better the pitcher, the more you have to try to make him think about other things other than just being able to get in his groove and throw strikes and get you out. Well, that is his fourth walk. We're only in the fourth with one out. Now, Rebele. Now, Rebele had a, a suicide squeeze butt his last time up there. And I'm sure that's what they're talking about now. What are we going to do if they try another squeeze? Do we want to throw it away toward the outside, or do we want to come inside and make him low bridge the hitter? Those are the choices you make. You, you mean know, if the pitcher, happens. the pitcher sees that the runner's breaking? Well, someone will yell for him and say, here he comes. We saw the squeeze in the first inning. They executed it perfectly because the runner at third, B.J. Serhoff, did not give it away. But the point is, if they give it away and they know it's coming, what are you going to do? All right. So you have to either knock the hitter down or throw it up and away. In the dirt. He's really struggling. 
Clemens has only one strikeout in this game, which is also a very unusual. Alomar at third, Surhoff at second. Boyles at first. And he has had two strikes in the count with only three batters of the game. And 52 pitches thrown already. Mel Queen, the pitching coach, out to talk to Roger Clemens. It's almost as though the rocket himself seems a little bit rattled, Joe, like he doesn't trust his own stuff tonight. Well, it, that's what was happening when he wasn't aggressive, when he wasn't really attacking the hitters with his fastball. We've basically seen him go with only two pitches, the fastball and the split. And he has not been able to, you know, get ahead of enough hitters where he can get them to chase the splitter. I think that's been his big problem. So it is one ball and no strikes to Rebele. Now, well, he took something off that pitch. Yeah, that's the first pitch that he's actually like thrown down the middle, so to speak, where he said, I'm going to throw a strike if you hit it okay. The other strikes have been on the corners. And that's okay if you got your good, you know, control that night. Three men on. That's foul. There's another one. See, I mean, he's got good enough stuff that he doesn't always have to hit the edges. I mean, that was the, those two pitches are fastballs, and they were both basically in the middle of the plate. Uh, is that a product of the fact that he came right out swinging that first ball fastball early on? Well, that may have had something to do with it. And he said, well, I'm going to try to make, you know, get ahead of him, but I got to make good pitches. I think if you've got stuff like Roger, you do not always have to be on the edges. Tried the splitter. Two and two. Baltimore with a great opportunity here to really open this game up. Leading two to one in the fourth inning. Bases loaded one out. Lead off man Jesus Tavares on deck. Middle infield double play deck. And the splitter for the strikeout. Well he's got a great one. But he only gets those when he gets ahead of the hitter and he gets the hitter to chase pitches out of the zone. He got Joe Carter to do it in the first inning and that is his second strikeout. I mean if you don't have two strikes you're not going to swing at this pitch because it's low and away and off the plate. But it's again it's so fast that you do not have time to think about it if you have two strikes. But if you're behind the count you just do not swing at those pitches. Blue Jays are getting their bullpen ready. As Jesus Tavares comes up he's flied out twice. He has swung at every pitch that Clemens has thrown to him yeah, so far. Right. <laughs> and you see right there that one's in the dirt and he still swings at it. He swung at the first pitch of the game and hit it in the air to center. He swung at the first pitch he saw in the second inning and flied out to fairly deep left center. Canseco made a very interesting catch on it. Now he's behind 0 1 with the bases loaded. In the bullpen, Blue Jays have right hander Luis Andujar warming up. Which is an odd sight in and of itself with Roger Clemens in the mound that the bullpen activity and only the fourth inning. Now he's ahead of him one ball and two strikes. Now ordinarily this would be Brady Anderson up right now. And Baltimore would be feeling a, a little more confident. But Brady hurt himself here on Friday. Alomar, Sirhoff, and Hoyles all ready to go in anything. Well, this, should, this should be another splitter. I mean, it is. He struck him out. Man, he has had to work tonight. Two to one Orioles. And Spray coming up. Their first match, they take on a powerful Germany. And that will be an incredible test for them right away. A veteran club, the Germans are sort of the Orioles of the World Cup. <laughs> a veteran club with some great stars, but also an older club. Joe Carter. Thrown out by Spray. And Carter, on Joe Carter night, is 0 for 3. Well, he has not seen many pitches from Roger Clemens. He's hacking at the first one he thinks he can reach. And that's not a bad idea against Clemens. Joe Carter facing the man who was his teammate last year. 0 for 3 tonight. Here's Harold Baines now. Right on the outside corner for a strike. Baines is always, I know, mystified you, Joe, because he stands so far off the plate. And yet, 
he seems to be able to cover the plate. Well, he, he has good mechanics because he goes to the ball with his upper body. When that ball is away from him, he goes with his upper body. He doesn't try to, he doesn't open up and pull off the pitch. He just goes to the ball with his upper body because he's basically hits with his upper body, similar to Tony Gwynn. Now he has virtually, I mean, maybe none, no cartilage in either knee, had several surgeries, which uh, precluded him from really playing the field for many, many years. Not trying to be funny, but he doesn't hit with his knees. I mean, he doesn't hit with his legs. I mean, he basically, as I said, is an upper body hitter. That's why he can continue to hit well when he doesn't have, you know, cartilage in his knees and stuff because he really doesn't use his legs, you know, to generate a lot of bat speed. Two and two the count. Just off the outside. Palmero on deck. Three and two to Baines. So without the DH rule, Baines either would have been out of baseball or just a pinch hitter for many, many years. Clemens keeping it out there. Page went out to get it, fouling it away. Three and two. Uh, that's an interesting point, and a lot of people are talking about eliminating the DH, and, and a lot of people say that no, it's part of the history of the game, and they want to keep it there. And you see, ranks right below Don Baylor as a DH, as far as home runs are concerned, and Cal McRae, the RBI at least. And he's got a base hit. He had a lot of those in his career too. Can he, he can just hit. He can hit. And that, but he, I mean, just that's a great example right there. He threw him a fastball away, fouled it down the left field line. He went out there and fouled it, threw him one over the middle to, of the plate in, and he, re, he just pulls it because he's going with his upper body. Watch his upper body. This is how he hits. See, he just goes to the ball with his upper body. See how he covers the entire plate that way? It's just a good hitter at work there. Well, he's so good that he has 2,608 career hits. Rafael Palmero, who's also a good hitter. You know, he reminds me of a little bit Al Oliver, who was uh, just a great hitter with the Pittsburgh Pirates. And Al was kind of one of those guys who could just always hit, but he never got the credit, in my opinion, he deserves as a hitter. I mean, he was a great hitter. Oliver, I saw him every day for two years. When he was in Texas, I was the broadcaster for the Texas Rangers. And you're talking about seeing line drives every right. single day. Yeah. I never saw a guy on an everyday basis who hit as many as Al Oliver. Yeah, he was, and like I say, he was just a great hitter. Splitter. Palmero just did get a piece of it. But when you talk about, when people talk about hitters and they talk about, you know, the Hall of Fame, all these great things, his name, you know, he doesn't get mentioned as much as I think he should. I mean, the guy was a great hitter. I agree with you. He, he had over, I think, 2,800 20, yeah, hits. Yeah, close to it. Yeah. And a perennial 300 hitter. Yeah. Won some championships with the Pirates. So it's not, I mean, he was on winning teams. He wasn't just a guy out there doing it on his own, you know, hitting for himself. So, but I mean, that's, there have been a lot of good hitters. I've always said, you know, another guy I think was a great hitter, Richie Zisk. I, I just, man, I love to watch him hit yeah. from the right side. Right up the middle. Well, that's why Paul Merrill's so tough. He not only. Hits the long ball, but every year he's, although last year was sort of an aberration for him, but every other year he's been right around 300 with the batting average. Well, what he does with two strikes is, I mean, he, he'll go ahead and give in a little bit. I mean, if you watch his career, most of his home runs and stuff come early in the count. There's a fastball moving away from him, and he just kind of watches his upper body. See, he doesn't pull off. He just kind of reaches out with his hands and arms and lines it back through the middle for a base hit. Rafael Palmero, 33 years of age. There's an Alomar fan. Yeah, he played here and he was a great player here. Helped him win two world championships. A great part of Toronto Blue Jays history. Two on, one out. And that's ball one. But, uh, Rafael Palmero, a lifetime 294 hitter. Fell to 254 last year. They thought he was trying to go for home runs at the expense of his batting average and it hurt him. He's driven in 100 RBIs or more for the last five years. Alomar meanwhile they were talking about some of his uh, great moments back in the World Series of 93 robbing Len Dykstra. I mean I think this is a tougher play than the first one we saw. I mean that is a tough play for a second baseman. 
And he charges, throws it from where he catches. As soon as he catches it, he flips it underhand. I mean, he's a fine second baseman, won six gold gloves, so and he helped them win two the championships in 92 and 93. Also a lot of division yeah. titles for the Jays here. Roberto Alomar, who actually was acquired in one of those blockbuster trades by the James from the San Diego Padres. That's a foul out of play. I remember the discussion came up, and I was talking to the owner of the Padres at that time, and they asked me about Roberto Alomar. I said, I would never trade him. I said, the guy has a chance to be the most valuable player in this league. And uh, they traded him indirectly. In There's Tony Fernandez, obviously. He was in the trade, but they traded him partly because he didn't want to play shortstop. They wanted him to move to shortstop and he was a second baseman. And I suggested that they don't trade him because you know he was he was one of the great players in the game. He was going to be at that time anyway. He was young then. Carter and Alomar came to Toronto. McGriff and Fernandez went to San Diego. And that's out of play. Not out of play actually hit the uh, box seat railing. Canseco giving an appearance on that one, although he had no chance to catch it. Two balls, two strikes to Roberto Alomar. Trying to put the Orioles back ahead here. Alomar is a free agent at the end of this year, as he was at the end of the 95 season. You know, by midseason in 95, he was making a lot of noise about leaving Toronto. The Blue Jays were playing poorly, and uh, he wanted to be traded to a contender. Ended up signing with the Orioles as a free agent. And uh, there have been murmurings out of the Orioles camp that he wants to, to get out of there to a, a contender again. And Cinco makes the catch. Back to second, Baines. Oh, and Rebeck could not hang on to it. Great play by Ken Seiko. Great attempt, but it was a tough hop for Graybeck. But they had him positioned perfectly for Roberto Alomar. Baines back to second, Palmero back to first. If Baines, we, that's an example of Baines not running well, so he knows he's got to get a good jump. But you can see he is out by a long shot if the ball does not short hop Graybeck so that he can't come up with it. Canseco fires back to second. A little better bounce, and he would have been out easily, but that's a tough hop for Graybeck to catch and stay on the bag. Now I'm B.J. Surhoff. Suddenly, it's the Orioles having a hard time getting that big hit against Roger Clemens. They left the bases loaded in the fourth. That is going to move the runners up. Well, it's just a matter of time before a couple of those get away because he has been bouncing that splitter a lot. And Fletcher has been doing a good job of keeping it in front of him. He had a couple with the bases loaded, but he was able to keep in front. This one he just can't. That ball's way off to the side. He tries to get his body over in front of it. But it hits him in the side and bounces away. And both runners move up. Two to two in the fifth inning. The Orioles have five hits against Clemens, plus four walks have been issued by Roger. They've had nine base runners in these five innings against Clemens. And the only hit they've been able to get in a spot like this was Cal Ripken's single in the second inning to knock home Alomar. From third base. Cal is on deck here. He would be next. Two down in the fifth. Jays have had similar problems. They've had some opportunities against Pete Smith, which they have not cashed in. Pete Smith relaxing here. Another long inning for Clemens. He's had two long innings in a row here. Working from the windup. Baines at third, Palmero at second. Is he pitching around. Uh, well, he felt off? he's trying to make a perfect pitch, or he's going to walk him. He doesn't. I mean, he doesn't really want to walk him and have to pitch to Ripken because he knows if he gets behind Ripken, Ripken can hurt him as well. So he's trying to get him out without giving him in, giving in. He's trying to do just that: throw that ball right on the outside corner and get BJ out. Three and one to Sirhoff. Runners at second and third. Time is taken. See the problem with pitching around hitters in this lineup, John, is where do you stop? 
I mean, you pitch around BJ, now you got Cal Ripken coming up, so you still have to go after him. Watch out of play. Three and two. Harold Baines, the possible go ahead run at third base. Rafael Palmero, the runner at second base. Both be running at the crack of the bat here with two down in the fifth inning. Well, this is that situation where you can bet a dollar or a thousand donuts that he's going to throw a splitter. There it is, and Sirhoff jumps on it for a base hit. Baines has scored. Here's Palmero. Green with a strong arm. He is sweet. The ball got away from the catcher. Darren Fletcher and over to second base goes Sirhoff. It is four to two for the Orioles. And you talked about how good a hitter Sirhoff is. Well, that's another good example. Another low pitch, and he just ripped it in the right field for a base hit. This is not exactly a spot that Roger wanted the splitter to come in, but you know he he was trying to throw a strike and keep it down. Well, let's take a look at the throw. The throw gets there. Fletcher will catch it with his glove hand. Now watch. He will try to tag him, and. No, he didn't catch it. The ball got away all the way, but he tried to make a one-handed catch and tag, and the throw got away from him. Cal Ripken takes a strike. They may not give an error. They may say that Serhoff took second on the throw in anyway. Well, we do know it's a single and two RBIs for B.J. Serhoff, and they have charged Fletcher with an error after they viewed our replay. Right to the shortstop, Alex Gonzalez. That's the inning. But two runs for the Orioles. They get that clutch two out hit from B.J. Serhoff. Jose Canseco, who has gone deep once tonight, coming up. The center field wall, and that's the view you get from out there where you have your uh, foie gras. Well, why don't we do a game from there one day? <laughs> we've, 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 been, we've been writing this letter to ESPN for years now. Yeah. You know, I had this feeling they think we're kidding. <laughs> Here's Jeff Rebele. He's had a suicide squeeze bunt, and he has also struck out with the bases loaded. That was a big moment for Clemens. He had the bases loaded, one out in the fourth, and the Orioles did not score. Clemens came into this inning having thrown 88 pitches in the game. One ball, one strike to Rebele. He has really labored so much so, and I, I know, Joe, that you wanted to. If everything's all right with him. Yeah, he just doesn't seem like the Roger Clemens that well, no, we're used to seeing, especially, you know, the Roger Clemens that pitched in his last start. Blue Jays have activity in their bullpen just in case. Clemens going to work with the lead for the first time. Two and two the count to Rebele. Lead off man Jesus Tavares is on deck. The Orioles have four runs, six hits against Clemens, plus he has walked four. And the split finger pitch is low. Full count. Luis Andujar warming up in the terrain. Uh, play the ball effectively. He hit fairly well. He gets a walk here. Now that's that's not Roger Clemens with a two-run lead and then walking the ninth place hitter. Right. Jesus Tavares comes up. And Tim Johnson's going to go out. 